you can email us because you won't. But in any case, if you did not get a need for the course, you can go to the website for the course and you can download a copy or if you lose it. Okay. So I put it there too under lecture notes. There's a set of notes under lecture notes. Um, Alright. <coughs> okay, recall. These petty producers, these agents, they own their own means of production. They set in motion their own labor, their, their own bosses, if you want. They produce the commodities, shoes, food, they produce the commodities with their own labor in their own means of production. And the surplus that they produce is appropriated by the individuals themselves. Sometimes it's called in Marxism individual appropriation. So you have the image that Engels starts out with in the mode of production, there is this ancient mode of production. In which there is the private ownership of the means, but once again, I'm repeating this, so you get this, by the individuals who are laboring. They own their own means of production, and they produce the commodities for sale with their own labor and their own means of production. Is that clear? Yeah. There's no wage labor. What was the term you used to uh, We're right. right. I can't hear you. What was the term you used to describe the surplus of the internet? So the, the uh, petty producer of the ancient appropriates the surplus labor given her herself. It's individual appropriation. Capitalism comes along, it grows out of, it grows within the ancient or whatever, however it comes about, and it kills and destroys the ancient mode of production. Okay. So capital, the capitalist mode of production kills the ancient. That, that's part of the selection. And Nichols claims, although he doesn't explain it really, what he claims is that the capitalists destroy the ancient by market competition. So the markets have to do with life and death, and I want to explain to you now how the ancients murder, I'm sorry, how the capitalists murder the ancients and grow stronger on the basis of the death of the ancients. That's the history. It takes a few hundred years for this to occur in England and the United States and France and so on. And out of the destruction of the ancients is going to come a wage labor force, powerful capitalism, and so forth. Out of this is going to come then a new relations of production, this wage labor, in which the masses of the population will now not own the means of production and be forced to sell the only thing they do own, which is their labor power, to those who own the means of production. That's capitalism. So let me do that. Okay? So this is a new set. I can, this is a new set of notes. So this is going to look complicated, but it's not. Okay? And if we ask you an exam about this, you know, you're going to use this. Like you're going to use the notes I gave you in the last lecture. Ready? So I'm going to start now with the following. I'm going to use the notation we've already developed. So here is the value of the means of production, tools, blah, 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 raw materials. And there are two kinds of modes of production, or class structures, was a synonym. There's the ancient, and there's the capitalist. So there are, in a society, there's many ancients, and there are just a few capitalists. Then there is the value of labor power in the two. So the ancient pays a wage to him or herself. So this is like in the United States today, this would be an MD, an ancient. 
The MD doesn't work for anybody, and nobody works for the MD, the doctor. And so the doctor has all kinds of C tools. You know, you go into the doctor's office, you see all that crap. Those medical devices, terribly expensive. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to set up a practice with the C, with the MD. They have to really borrow one. But then also the doctor pays him or herself a salary. Recognized in the, when the agent of the MD files his or her income tax, you're allowed to pay yourself a salary. It's deducted from your gross revenues. It's an expense. The capitalist pays wages to workers. A different group. Then, of course, there is also the profit for each. And then, of course, there is the value. Okay. So I'm going to assume the same product that's produced by these two different groups, let's say shoes. Okay, so let me start. So suppose each of them, suppose each of them purchases foot dollars worth of tools, raw materials, and so forth, that they use up to produce their shoes. Questions? You got it? Suppose the, the wages are two dollars for each. That is, the ancients pay themselves a wage of two bucks for a salary, then the capitalists pay their workers two bucks. So they, they're the same. And suppose both, using the same numbers that we develop, get two dollars of profit and the value of the shoes are eight bucks. How many shoes? I don't know. So let's put over here the number of shoes. Marx calls this the number of things, UVs, the number of things, UVs, use values produced. Let's say one pair of shoes. Or ten thousand, it doesn't make any difference. Whatever it is, a hundred. We now know what the price of a pair of shoes in the market. The price of a pair of shoes is uh, sixteen dollars divided by two, so the price is eight dollars for a pair of shoes. So that's the total <coughs> summation of the W's divided by the total number of use values, which is one plus one. <coughs> so this is the price of a pair of shoes. In R, I'm going to assume a competitive market. Next, to make life easy for me, I'm going to assume here that one dollar is equal to one hour of labor. This would then be for each of them four hours, because two dollars is four is two. Two dollars is two hours, two dollars is two hours, two plus two is four dollars, and that's the same as four hours. That's my son, because it makes the numbers easy. So there are four hours. And what is this equal to? What's that? In terms of what I told you last time. Oh. It's not really. So what's the summation here? This four hours. If it's capitalism, the capitalist pays the workers two dollars or two hours. And what does the capitalist get? That's the loss, two bucks. What does the capitalist get? That's correct. So the capitalist gets back then in dollars, four bucks, or in the other accounting scene, four hours. So the four hours is what the capitalist acquires, and as I told you, that's the use value of labor power. Here it is. So don't lose that. You need it. That's correct. What do you do? So the capitalist hires the worker, gives the worker two hours or two bucks, 
And the capitalists spent, yes, more than what Ishii gave up in the market. The more is the $4 or the $4 and minus two is the dollars and profits. Questions? Okay, so what's the difference between the surplus value in the ancients and the capitalists? Why are they the same? They're the same. I'm assuming this. Why? Uh, it's easy to stop that way. Okay. It doesn't have to be good. Because, like, I'm just thinking, like, in a real market, when I it's not a real market. But I'm going to start with the same, and then I'll show you. Okay, bye, bye, bye. Everybody does this. Alright. They all start, you start easy and make it complicated. If I start complicated, <laughs> And make it even more complicated, I'll lose you. But more importantly, I'll lose myself. So, I gotta start easy and get complicated. Remember that for the rest of your life. You always start easy and then get complicated. And whatever thing you're doing. Uh, okay, this. Let's take the ancient. The ancient gives him or herself how much in dollars? The ancient. Two bucks. What does the agent get from him or herself? Nope. This is the focus on this. Nope. They get it. If you say all the numbers. So the agent gives him or herself two dollars to reproduce him or herself as an agent. It gets four. But notice. The ancient is getting the two that the ancient produces. The calculus is getting the extra two that the worker produces. Two different kinds of exploitation. For the ancient, there is self-exploitation. Because the worker gives him or herself two and gets back from him or her the same person four. That's why owning your own business has always been an attraction around the world. Because you produce the profits, but you get the profits you produce. Okay, now we're going to do your next question. If everyone, I don't want to go on until you, until you're comfortable with what I got here, because once I get going, you're going to lose it. Yes, sir. Do you get to go how uh, laborers or how the capitalists are getting poor at the Either two dollars you're giving them, I'm confused. How to get four? Okay, that's what Marx invented, so you should be confused. Because confusion in this case is a sign of a healthy mind. I don't know why I said that. But... <laughs> okay, so the capitalist gives a wage to the worker, okay? And the worker, the worker can't, let's let me back up and leave stuff. The worker can't produce his or her own shoes because they, okay. So the worker gets two dollars and goes out and buy shoes and food and so forth, etc. <laughs> the worker goes to work for four hours. That's the length of the work day. So what the capitalist gets from the worker is the usefulness of the worker's labor power. The actual labor performed. Four hours. That's the assumed length of the work. So four hours is the actual what you get in, in, in the factory producing shoes. The capitalist gets the four hours, but need only give half of it back to the worker as paid labor. Two hours, or two dollars. Hence, the capitalist is left with the residual. Which is this surplus at the residual of the two hours, or two dollars. So this really is a, uh, a golden goose. 
from the nursery mill. That's what labor power is. It delivers more than it costs. If you can be in, in how do you get it? You gotta be a capitalist. Okay, I had way back in the, to the end, to the back of the room, somebody had a question. <coughs> Any others on this? Yes, sir. What's the difference that many A? Could you do it a little loudly, sir? What's the difference that many A and the few that have this that? What is this? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Many yeah. apples. This is, no. <laughs> this is many <laughs> ancients. Okay. Many petty, small producers. Many MDs. Yeah. Many. Lots of them. Anything else? It's worth taking a moment to make sure we all got it. Yes, sir. Um, could you just like, go over again with the C and the S C and W stand for? All right, I will, I will, because I'm a nice guy. But after I finish, I'm going to ask you, because I'm not a nice guy. So C is the value, whether it be in dollars or hours, it's the value of the tools, the raw materials, the machines, the factories. I'm going to need the last part. Use the to produce the commodity in question. So the accountants call this depreciation. So it's the value of the physical inputs required to produce shoes that you use up in producing the shoes in that period. This is the cost of labor power. Because to produce anything, you need two things. You need tools and labor power. So this is what you have to pay either your, yourself or workers to get labor. You used to have labor power. This is the payoff. What? To so the workers or to so the capitalists? I can't even. To so the workers or to the capitalists? That's the wages. So <coughs> well, in capitalism, which is his question. The capitalists give the workers two dollars or two hours. The capitalists give the workers two dollars or two hours, but the capitalists get from them a profit above and beyond the two. They get four. That goes to the capitalists. The capitalists own the shoes. The capitalists own the labor power when you know, at the buying, they set it to you know, produce shoes, they own the tools, they are the owners of the surplus value. In the ancient, they are the capitalist, in a sense, is the ancient inverse. So in that case, the ancient producer is has kind of a split personality. One person, two personalities. In one personality, the person is a producer, and the other personality, the person is the appropriator of the surplus. Yes? Alright, so the capitalist gives the worker $4 worth of materials, says, make me some shoes. Yes, say, say the first five Alright, so the capitalist gives the worker $4 worth of material, basically, and says, make me shoes. And I'll pay you $2, and the work that the worker does adds four dollars of value to the shoes. Called value added, right? And then, okay, that's it. That's the whole thing. Yeah, and you've got to sell the shoes for eight bucks to cover the first thing you said, the cost of raw materials, for four bucks, which the capital set come up, plus the wages of the capital set come up, with, and to realize the profits of two bucks in those pair of shoes. Because if you sell it for less than eight dollars, that's a problem. <laughs> you see that? So if you sell this for six dollars, you know, we got a problem because that covers this, but by goodness gracious me, there ain't no profits. Price for it, I would do it. Last year. The one question is going to be get enough. I didn't say you could ask your question. <laughs> <laughs> What is W? I mean, I know it's a W? Whatever it is you want. The W is the total value of that which is being produced. 
It's a summation of the C plus B plus S. CBS, not the question. It's the total fact, the total summation of all the commodities we produce. Um, you learned it for those of you economic majors. This is P times Q. This is $8. That's the P. The Q is 1. 8 times 1 is Total sales. I like it. So I'm going to let you ask your question. Go ahead. I'm teasing. Loudly, so I can hear the question. Um, so is surplus value like, actually necessary? Like, couldn't we just have. Were you here last time? Yes. Suppose it were the case. That the workers rose up and not strike and said, We will not work for you unless you pay us four dollars. And the capitalist said, Okay, give you four bucks. And if the market price was the same, there would be zero profits. What would happen to the capitalists? That's my question to you, huh? They would die. So Good. Wait, wait, wait. I mean, I thought that they would die. Why would they die? <laughs> Which I agree. Because there's no surplus value for them to eat. I know that. You just repeated it. Why would they die? Because they can't get anything from the worker. They can't exploit the worker. Okay, but what is that? Why does that necessarily imply their death? The capitalist death. No, I don't listen to that. <laughs> but don't listen to the professor. Don't pay any attention. Why would the capitalists die? Um, Why would General Motors die if there were no profits? Or General Electric? Or Microsoft? I well, you, you, you're going to have to because when you graduate, you may, you know, I don't know, you may go on to graduate school or medical school, or whatever, but if you interview for a job, that is a question that is often asked. Because you want to come up with the answer. So this is a tiny moment of why you got know, Why do we want to make a profit in this corporation? And how are you going to help her make a profit? So it's really an important question that you ask. So, OK, now somebody did raise the hand. Pay taxes, pay the bankers, pay the bankers. Pay the oh. bankers. So you want to make a profit. So you can take that profit and use it to pay your, what he just did, your managers, to pay the state the taxes you owe, to pay the bankers the interest that you borrowed, to pay the rents to the landlords, to pay your research and development budget, to pay your advertisers so they can come up with those incredible ads that were shown at the Super Bowl, to hustle your product. The most interesting thing in the Super Bowl for me were the ads. I would walk out of the room in the football game, come back, and my wife said, The ads are on! No. <laughs> you got to pay the, you know, the advertising budget. So you can, what was it? I read Priceless Ad. You saw it, Mr. Senior. You saw the Priceless Ad for that car, I think, ran $22 million. For a what, a two or three minute ad. That comes out of the surface. As you're going to, as I'm going to show you in a moment, the purchase of new machines and new technology that comes out of the surface. So if the surplus is zero, then the uh, uh, capitalist can't recreate the conditions of business and will die. Got that now? Yes. Okay, I have a different answer, so maybe I'm wrong. Um, okay, you're wrong. <laughs> all right. So, hear me out for a second, though. Um, so, in order for the capitalists to get paid, like, their labor is managing and stuff. So, it's not that different from what he said, but, like, the same way the workers are getting paid to actually manufacture the, uh, the uh, shoes out of the raw materials, the capitalists are getting paid to manage the, the business to produce materials and stuff. So, without the surplus, capitalists would have no wage. 
Absolutely. What, his is a sophisticated, sophisticated elaboration of what we just did. He wants to say, look. Oh, no. I mean, since you just did it, I'm going to now make use of what you just did. So, The capitalist is actually many persons. The capitalist is the receiver of the product in the market corporation. Think of a person who sits on the board of directors. A person who sits on the board of directors of a market corporation personifies the corporation. And then legally, culturally, and economically, that person receives the products. And it's not done with a lot of people. You're talking about 20, 22 people that receive the surplus in the in capitalism. But that same person may also, not necessary, but that same person may also take on another personality as a manager or CEO or CF, uh, chief executive officer, CEO, CFO, chief financial officer of the university and pay him herself a salary for so doing. That one person then has two positions, as you might say. So one position is a receiver sitting on the board of directors of the surplus of Tupac, and the other position takes a portion of the surplus and distributes it to him or herself as a salary fund management. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. <laughs> suppose, you ready man? Suppose that person sitting on the board gets the two bucks on General Electric, and that person takes the two dollars and pays him herself two dollars as the CEO of the corporation. Then what will happen? Take a moment, take it through, and then answer. Can you repeat the question? Bing! <laughs> Please answer. All you want is more time. Um, I don't have to repeat it. You know the question. Mm -hmm. right. What happens if the CEO... Yeah, what happens, what happens, happens if, the, if the person sitting on the board gets two, two bucks, just like you said, but then the person gives two dollars to him herself as the CEO of the corporation? Then what will happen to the corporation? So there's no money for R and D, no money for the extra managers, no money for like Bravo to you. Fantastic, fantastic. So that corporation will die for a different reason, because then the corporation has taken all of the profits, or what the business called all of the gross profits, and paid him herself out of all the profits, and yet there's nothing left over. Well, under the, actually, under the law of such, such a, a situation, that person can be actually sued by the stockholders for not acting in a prudent way. You can see the complexity of what this means. It's getting more complex. We're going way beyond Mr. Lent, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Engels. It's very, very, these are two good questions that were asked. You're on a roll, you won't put any more. There's going to be some that I can't answer for sure. But they, the two of them can answer. More. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry the question, but uh, a few years ago, Sony sold their PlayStation 3 at lower than production costs. And they actually lost money on every PlayStation 3 that they sold. Yeah. And it's just like interesting to think about. This inflation and plug into that. I guess I, don't, I just brought it up to say the stockholders can sue the company. But I guess their thing behind it was they're trying to make money off accessories and stuff. So I don't know if they actually come well in the feeling. Yeah. Look, you, you, I mean, you, you answered your own question. Okay. Which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> is that it's quite possible that he gets the square. This was, okay. This is way, 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 way to be honest, though. Corporations don't just produce one commodity. They produce many commodities. So it's quite possible that a corporation could produce one commodity and sell it, sell it at a loss, just like you said. You said they sell it for whatever, five bucks or six, whatever. You know, they sell it five and then they, they cover the, you know, they get no profits and they have to cut into this. It's a loss. They have a problem on their hands. But they're producing other kinds of commodities which are complementary to this, whatever the thing that you mentioned. <laughs> and hence, by selling the commodity at a loss, they stimulate the sales of these other commodities, 
and they make more money, you know, more money on coke. That's a very sophisticated kind of uh, uh, approach, but corporations, you know, can do this all the time. And then you would be hired as a manager to get a cut of the surplus, but figuring out that what's called the business strategy. So you've heard of loss leaders and all that type of stuff, and this would be an example of it. If you could just extend that example, okay, someone else. Yes, where are you, sir? I was just going to add on to about the PlayStation 3 example, where they might want, they might have done that to uh, increase market share for uh, the whole HD DVD and the Blu-ray. That's right. As the gentleman said, they were in competition with other companies, and what a company wants to do is carve out more of a market share. That is. More sales, more value, and one way to do that is to sell this particular product um, at a loss. This you know, capture more than one. And this gets very, very tricky, okay? Because uh, you know, sometimes uh, they could be uh, legal cases on these issues. In which the your competitors can take this or try and take this company, uh, you know, Sony or whatever the case, to, to court by saying they're trying to destroy us and it's anti competitive. You know, this, is, this gets to be a legal problem. I have no idea what this we were doing. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not PlayStation. Suppose the following occurred. Following in this example that I just gave. Suppose suppose the capitalist decides to buy more machines. Capitalism is typically associated with mechanization. Suppose the catalyst decides, and I'll show you in a moment why, the catalyst decides to purchase more machines. They could be better machines, they could be same machines, whatever the case may be. Goes to a bank, borrows money, borrows machines. And suppose more machines enables the capitalist to produce more. Make sense? In economics, a higher Capital labor ratio means that the output per labor rises. So they're producing now two machines. In other words, here's another column for you. The number of use values per unit labor has gone from in the in the in the old case it was one divided by four. Okay, it's now two divided by four. So you get more numerator, more shoes for the same amount of labor. The productivity of labor has risen. For whom? For the capitals. The ancients are passive. They sit there and don't know what's going on. It's a private enterprise. Private. So the capitalists take an action and the ancients don't know about it. That's it. And they purchase more machines, which gives them a higher productivity. Hint, the productivity of labor rises in part because the capital labor ratio rises. Let's do that. C over C plus B. In this case, the C was uh, 4 plus. Four, four plus two is six. In this case, it's eight plus two is ten. Look what's happened. The composition of capital has gone up. For the capitalists, the ancient remains the same. This is an index from Mr. Marx of mechanization. Mechanization. <coughs> Capitalists are doing what they're supposed to do. Last one. Last call. C 
plus V divided by UV. What's this? What is that? C plus V divided by in 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 the Boston Globe, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. What is that? Call. Cost of production. Huh? Cost of insult. The cost of production, the cost of itself. Can you use a more fancy name? What did you all learn? What's it called? What's in the numerator? Production cost. What's in the denominator? Output. What is, what is this then, Mark? This is average cost. Cost per unit. Cost numerator per line unit. Cost per unit. Average cost. So this is average cost. This is average cost. This is uh, six divided by one. So the cost per unit. This is ten divided. By wow. Look at something. There's something new here. Sorry. There's no way you can read that. What's that? The difference. Okay, I think the cost of magnetization made the average cost. cost of magnetization made the price for production go down. So the the capitalist has lowered the average cost by buying more machines. Doesn't lower the rate of profit. No one's But I'll show you what's going to happen. Let's get the first step before I do anything else. The average cost for the capitalist. The capitalist has become the low cost producer by purchasing more machines. Now, this is very sophisticated. And again, some of you are going to do this when you graduate. Notice something. The capitalist has gone out and purchased more machines. So the capitalist costs have gone up where the ancient. No, the capitalists have a higher cost than the ancients. Because the capitalists now have, you can see, $10 a cost. The ancients stay with six. The cost have gone up. That's not what matters. What matters is what the extra cost delivers. We can be biblical. And what the extra cost is delivered to the capitalist is a higher productivity, such that the unit costs fall from six to five. So, yeah, there's an increase in the uh, uh, numerator because you're purchasing more C, but the denominator increases proportionally more so that the average costs fall. That's what a manager has to figure out. That's when a manager gets a salary as a cut of the surplus for precisely figuring out whether or not they should buy more machines. Does it lower their average cost? In this case, the way I've done it, the answer is yes. Now we have to do, we have to ask, what's the consequences of this? Why do this? And this is done every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, of every decade, of every century in the history of capitalism. So this is really, according to Engels at least, a law, social law of capitalism. And it's called competition. That's why this is done. Which is the next step. Okay. Okay, ready? We have a new price of shoes. Why? Because we have a new total value here to be consistent. We now have A plus 2 plus 2 is then, so this is now 12. So we now have three pairs of shoes, and we have $20 of value. And hence, the new price in the market is no longer A. That's the old. The new price is, here, is 20 divided by 3 is 6 and 2 thirds. The price of a pair of shoes is small. And why is the price of a pair of shoes small? Because the average price, average cost of shoes. And why is the average cost small? Because <clears throat> they were able to uh, get capital or tools that would produce at a more efficient rate. Okay. So, you have one reason historically why prices of products fall, like computers, high definition TV sets, and so forth. If the prices of these things fall, 
because the productivity of labor goes up. And the productivity of labor goes up because of mechanization. That's an answer. This is non uh, angles now. Okay, what you've learned, so I can tie it to what you've already learned. If the supply curve shifts more to the right than does the demand curve, the price falls. And the supply curve shifts more to the right because of the rise in the productivity of labor. So one of the reasons for falling prices in capitalism is an increase in the productivity of labor. And that's a wonderful thing. Because now you have more shoes, three, at a lower price. That's pretty good. All the demand on the side. Okay, then we want to ask, that's, that's a wonderful thing, says Mr. Angles. Capitalism enables us to have more wealth, three pairs rather than two, at lower prices. The real price of an automobile today is much cheaper than what it was when old man Ford was producing. The real price. Much cheaper today. And look at all the automobiles. So the wealth is gone at a lower rate of price. Okay? Now I'm going to show you this is fantastic. Now I'm going to show you a disaster. Or Angles is going to show you a disaster. This is a new price. If it's a competitive market, everybody has to sell at that price. So I'm going to erase this now. Well, I'm going to erase it. Okay. I'm going to put here the revenues, total sales revenues in dollars, minus the cost. In dollars, and over here, the difference between the two of us are our profits. So here's the new price. If it's competition, everybody has to sell at the same price. That's what competition means. There's one market in shoes, and every producer has to sell at that price. What you learned is a perfectly elastic demand curve facing the producer. It's elastic at the price of six and two thirds. So the ancients the ancients come to market, okay, with one pair of shoes, and they sell it for six and two thirds. That's the price times one. Six and two thirds. Their costs were four plus two. Were six. That's their production costs. Hence their new profits are two thirds. 67 cents. The capitalists come to market, they sell on these shoes, two pairs, at six and two, six and two thirds. That's, well, 13 and a third. The costs are 10. Eight plus two. That's three and a third dollars. What's happening? This is one of the most important lessons in economics. What has happened as a result of the market? Profit has gone up for the And profit has gone down for the boom. That's the answer. <coughs> Here's where we start. They all had two dollars. That's why I started. I had to start something. As a result of market competition, the ancients have a disaster. And if this continues, those ancients will die. And they did that. And the capitalists are as happy as they can be. And they will prosper. As the ancients die, and they will, and they did, what happens to them? In other words, as this continues, this is going to become zero and negative. Yes? I'm sorry? That's the answer. That's what Mr. Engels did. So what he's shown you is out of competition, 
arises a class of individuals who sell their labor power in order to survive. And the ancients lose their businesses, their means of production. They die. They socially die. The mode of production disappears. Why? Competition. I mean, there's other reasons as well. But competition is a force that will destroy the ancients, enabling the capitalists to grow stronger and bigger. And as the capitalists do that, as they grow stronger and bigger, they will now employ some of the ancients who have lost their businesses. That's the, out of competition comes the demand and supply for labor. By the way, is it necessarily the case that the capitalists will employ all of the many ancients? No. No. Now you've got a reason for unemployment. It's got nothing to do with these ancients, you know, don't want to work. You know that's stupid. That really is dumb, anybody that says that. Most people that have been brought up, they want to work. The worst thing in their life is not to work. But there's no rhyme or reason to this that says the capitalists will employ all of the dispossessed ancients. And so unemployment can come out of this competition. And if you have a lot of unemployment, if the capitalists, why might the, by the way, from what I've already told you, why is it the case that the capitalists may not employ all of the ancients? Mechanization. Can you quick? Mechanization. That's the answer. The capitalists employ more machines. So the capital labor ratio is wise. They're using, they're saving on labor, as it were. So they may not employ, they may, but they may not employ all of the ancients, and the ancients become unemployed. <laughs> unemployed. Put your hand down. If the ancients become unemployed, then what? What's the consequence? Yeah, man. Huge leverage to the corporations. But just simple stuff. If the ancients become unemployed, yeah, man. They what? Die or become thieves? Yes, yeah, some of them. They may, they may become thieves. They might try to steal shoes. Why? Because they can't buy shoes. They may steal them. Sure. What else? Yeah. They make a competitive market for lower wages. Good man. So you might get stealing out of it. Number number two. You might also get lower wages. Right? Because they adding that they're competing for as you said scarce jobs. They may lower the wages or put down the pressure on the wages. Third, maybe the manufacturers who are producing these shoes, these capitalists can, can't sell all their shoes. They're so productive because of unemployment, the market's not there. So you're getting all kinds of interesting consequences as a result of competition. Yes, sir. Could you specialize your own labor? Like, could you become the person who faces the machines? Yes, for sure. Then you might seek new jobs, a fixer of machines. Absolutely. In fact, the state may intervene and set up a program which says that we're going to train people to fix machines to get them jobs and they can buy shoes. Now, who is the person that had to do that? I'm just a little bit, a little, a little bit confused as the specifics on of that equation part on the left side of the chalkboard. Which one? I, I just can't read the sum so well. This one? Yeah. This is in the numerator. This is the total value. This is like computer plus. So you add up the total value and you divide by the number of things. And the quotient is the price. That's how the federal government computes prices of anything. So they, they hire people to do this. So just because the capitalists are able to produce more and more, it just makes things cheaper. And then the ancient producers have to sell what they're producing for less and they're still not producing. Okay, I'm going to do it again. I'll do that again. That step to make sure it's clear. Let me do that step again. The capitalists and the ancients, they produce shoes and they have to they want and they have to sell their shoes on the market. So the market is uh, a social space in which all the private producers sell their goods at the same price. That's what I mean by social. Everybody faces a shoe market as a seller, producer and seller of shoes, and you sell them at the same price. That's what competition means. So the capitalists come to market, 
And they would be very happy, let me put these numbers back on here, because I erased them. So it'd be easy if you see the other numbers. All right. Let's see this. So I got the ancients and I got the gallons. Uh, four, two, two, eight, uh, eight, two, two, uh, twelve, uh, ten, twelve. Uh, is that right? Yeah. The capital, uh, let's take the ancients first. The ancients come to the market and they want to sell their shoes to cover their costs and to realize their profits. They want to sell their shoes at what price? Cheap. Cheap. So that the ancient the ancients say, okay, we produce shoes. We do, you know, we do what we're supposed to be doing. We work hard, we produce shoes, and we want to sell those shoes for eight dollars. Why? Because if we can sell them for eight bucks, we'll cover our costs, four plus two, and we'll make a profit. They can't. They want to, but they can't. What stops them from selling for eight? Capitalists. That's it. So that because of what the capitalist has done in the private domain of the factory, the agent is forced to sell at six and two thirds. So they cover their cost of six, but they lose one and two thirds of profits. Because of, you ready now, the language of business, because of the offensive action of the capitalists, this will competition. The agents have no choice but to sell at the market price. Let's do the capitalists to make sure we drive it home. The capitalists, eight, 10, 12, they would be happy to sell for six, because that will they sell at two pairs of shoes, six bucks for each pair. So that would be twelve bucks. That covers their costs and their profits. They can sell for more than what they would like because of the relatively inefficient agents who are pushing up the marketplace. So Everyone, every producer faces a social price. Every private producer faces the same price, which is six and two thirds. That's the market price. And because of that, there are private consequences that take place, which is the ancient that soon discovers that he, she is relatively inefficient, their profits have fallen. The capitalist discovers that their business is relatively more efficient than their profits rise. And the falling profits on the one hand, the agents, and the rising profits on the other, the capitalist is the, uh, it's the index of life and death in the market. For example, says the agents are going to be destroyed in, in every single industry that you can think of. So you start out with a sea of agents in the United States, in New England. In shoe production, everything, tools, shoe production, everything, shirts, uh, rifles, very famous, so rifles, in which the ancients produce their. If you, if you look at an old you know, colonial rifle, a weapon, you'll see the, the name of the maker right stamped right on the rifle. So if you get one of these, they're worth a fortune. Furniture, you see the name of the furniture maker, you know, silverware, copper. Over here, that's what that's worth. A set of teeth. You make teeth. Wouldn't you? So you see their name of the ancient. You, know, you, know, you see that. You don't see that with, with capitalists. What you see is the name of the corporation. So You don't see them. It's not producer. Whereas the ancient, there is. So in every single product, whether it be in agriculture or industry at the time, those ancients were destroyed by the rising capitalists. And the capitalists themselves, something came from the ancient. That is, some of those capitalists were somewhat successful. They began to hire labor. Their surplus grew 
because as they hired more labor, they got more surplus. That's not the case of the ancient. The ancient's profits are limited by the number of, by what? By the number of hours that the ancient can work. You know, the limit, 24 hours. Whereas the capitalists can hire, hire more, more workers, get more profits, get more machines, hire more managers, and kill the engines. Can you? Yes, sir. Aren't they killing themselves, though, by killing the ancients? Huh? Aren't they killing themselves by killing the ancients? Aren't they killing themselves by killing the ancients? I don't understand. In the long run, if I mean, are the capitalists killing themselves? Right. Yes. right. Well, I mean, if they're killing the ancients, they're eroding into their excess profits, aren't they? Because as they kill the ancients, the capitalists are driving the price down. Yes. So aren't they eroding their profits? Yeah. profits? You know, they're driving the price down, but if they can sell more and more products, even at that lower price, their gross profits may rise. But in any case, hold off, and I'll show you next time when we get to that. Is there, any way, is there anything the ancients can do to resist this? Make a specialty product you can charge more for. Good. One of the things the ancients can do and did do and still do is the following, just what you just said. The ancients produce a new idea, which they try to circulate as much as they can. The new idea is the following. My ancient product is better than the capitalist product, which stinks. My shoes will fit you better. Because they are hand-crafted. That's what the, word, the term means. They are not machine-crafted like those terrible capitalists. They are hand-crafted, and hence, a shoe is not a shoe. What the ancient is doing is something very sophisticated. They're trying to stop this competitive process by saying there's two different kinds of commodities, two different markets. Is the handcrafted shoe, shirt, sweater, medical craft, medical service, then there's that capitalist one. And hence we can charge a higher price because we've got a better quality product. My son, bless him, told me not too long ago, he bought a pair of, I'm not kidding you, boots he wears from a boot maker in Vermont, where all the boot makers exist, for a thousand dollars. I said, you get what you can't afford. I said, you're crazy. I can say that to my son. What did you do? He said, oh, he didn't describe to me for a half hour why this wasn't an ordinary boot. This boot would last for 50 years. <laughs> he won't last for 50 more years for the boot, but <laughs> that's what an ancient can do. So you go, over, you go out here to the student union in the springtime. You will see all the ancients with their jewelry and so forth, their sweaters, their scarves. It's in crap. And they will put their name on the scarf or whatever to show that it was crap. Anything else the ancient could do? Government regulation? Or yes, the ancient could go to the state. That's right. And say, you got to give us an advantage. Because we're a small wall business. This is the source of a small business legislation. And you've got to give us credit. You've got to give us some advantage so that we don't get killed by these capitalists. That's part of the history of the United States. Very famous in a variety of different you know, industries in the United States. For example, uh, pulling teeth was once done in the United States, for long periods of time, right up into the 19th century, was done by barbers. They, they, not only did they cut your hair, but they pulled your two teeth at the same time. They were the dentists. They were ages that gave two services, hair cutting and tooth pulling. <coughs> the dentist quickly went to work, Went to the state and said, No, you can't do that. To protect our business, you have to be licensed to pull teeth. And so they you know, not become a cooler of teeth. And for some states to actually cut here, you need a license. You have to pass an exam. <coughs> and at the time, there was a big debate about this whether the practicing dentist would pull teeth better than a barber. 
that's duplicated in many different industries or many different products. Okay. So Engels is describing now we're done with this how competition kills off these angels. Any more questions on this? And this will just continue. Right. The capitalist now has more workers. The capitalist now has more profits, more machines. <coughs> Engels says the capitalists now will hire managers, which will raise the productivity of workers as well as the new machines, and the eventual answer to, 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 you know, to what happens in this kind of society, which has the ancient and the capitalist, is the triumph of the capitalists over and above the ancients. Okay, you got this now? So we get the death of the ancients. <coughs> Let's get now move the, the, these capitalists, this wage labor system. Let me pick up Engels now. Engels then talks about the capitalists and he says, look, these capitalists, not only will they produce, I'm sorry, not only will they purchase machines, and those machines will embody new technology of producing shoes, but the capitalists will also deploy Cooperation in division of labor. Let me read. Why? Well, because here's the image that Engels gives. It's very nice. Image. He says, "Look, when you destroy these agents and when you buy their labor power, because they have no other choice, then you assemble all these former agents together in one location, a factory, a shoe factory. You bring them together to do what? To produce shoes. There. But in bringing them together, you have to get them to cooperate with one another." the different people to produce shoes. In the factory, you now have a division of labor in the factory producing shoes. Like what? Well, one person will work on glass. Another person will be a sewer. Another person will work on soles, heels, blah, blah, blah. And then they all have to cooperate with one another to produce a shoe. So you're going to get those laborers who are specialized in a particular task, division of labor, to cooperate so that the outcome is not chaos, but it's a shoe that you can produce and sell for $6.67. And this cooperation in division of labor and this deploying of new tools by these laborers who are laborers who are cooperating with one another raises the productivity of labor. So the productivity of labor goes up and unit costs fall because of two reasons. There are many reasons, but Engel gives two. One, the purchase of new machines in bombing new technology. And number two, cooperation division of labor. You can have one without the other. You know, we'll talk about it. Next. Who buys these machines? Who makes sure that these people, are the workers, are cooperating with one another and engaging in a division of labor. Here's the answer, managers. So the uh, capitalist not only hires wage labor, but also hires a new kind of labor, management labor, to oversee the workers, to purchase new machines, because someone's got to do this, and to make sure the cooperation and division of labor is occurring in society. What the hell do these managers do? Ready now? The managers plan all of this. Uh, what's Engel's conclusion? Planning arises in capitalism. You see what the man is done? It's a trick, which I hope I'll explain. So planning doesn't come from outside of capitalism. Planning, socialism, arises inside capitalism. We're all together. The very capitalist competition, the mechanization, blah, 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 the hiring of managers, the raise of productivity, this competitive race, all of this means that inside factories, not just quick new factories, but every factory you can possibly think of, including in agriculture, managers plan, organize, staff, direct, and control the local economy. That is inside the factory. That's what managers do. That's what they get paid a cut from the surplus to do. So Engels concludes, planning arises out of the dynamic of capitalism. Very clever. Hard to write. Okay. Let's put it 
together now. What we have in capitalism then is the collectivization of workers in one place. And those workers are using collectivized means of production. That is the, the tools and the, the seed. The tools back and so forth, etc. The machines have all been collectivized and are used by collectivized workers. So we have collectivized workers using collectivized means of production to produce these shoes which are sold in the market. A synonym for collectivization is socialization. So it's just a different way of saying the same thing. We have the socialization, the bringing together of the means of production and the bringing together of the workers to produce the shoes which are sold on the market. However, the ownership of the means of production remain, and the ownership of the shoes remains private. So we juxtapose the private ownership of the means of production and the products with the collective or the socialized use of the means of production. The relations of production remain private, are and remain private. The forces of production, the technology of producing shoes, have been socialized. There's a contradiction between the private relations, private property, private ownership of means of production, in the socialized forces in the mode of production in capitalism. He compares and contrasts that with the ancient. He says, in the ancient, what do we have? Well, let's see now. We have private ownership of the means of production, private ownership of the uh, products, but he also had the same person who owned the, the uh, means of production and owned the products also produced those products. So he says, look, we have a correspondence between private relations of production and private forces of production. Private, private. In capitalism, it's private versus social. That is, the private ownership of the means of production and the products, that remains like it was in the ancient. But capitalism has gone, has undertaken a dramatic change compared to the ancient, because now, the forces of production, how we produce shoes, have become collectivized or socialized, bringing together of all these workers on the one roof. <coughs> excuse me. The collectivization of the means of production finally he adds to this the market in his story. He says in capitalism, as compared to the ancient, it's a the ancient and the capitalists both produced for the market. The difference is, in capitalism, the workers, for the first time, are completely dependent on the market where they would not, where they weren't in the ancient. If the, the ancient produced the shoes for him or herself, that which you couldn't sell. In capitalism, that's no longer the case. If the capitalist firm, if this firm, for whatever reason, can't sell shoes, then they'll unemploy workers. We just did that. So the extension of the market, such that it touches everybody in society, means a new kind of ready, socialization that occurs in capitalism, which is no one in the society is independent of the market. To jump. In the United States today, American labor can be unemployed because of what occurs in Europe or Japan or China or Brazil. No one, that's what a market is, no one is immune from the consequences of the market. So capitalism carries that idea to its logical extension with the labor power market. Unemployment, unemployed labor then, can occur because corporations, for whatever complicated reason, can't sell their products, whatever reason. Okay, so this mode, this capitalist mode of production, once again, comprising the relations and forces of production. We have, again, the private appropriation of the profits, the surplus, the private ownership of the products, everybody, all the products. We have the, in the forces of production, the socialization of production, the collectivization of socialization of the workers, and now the socialization of the 
the market. And he says, a new problem can occur in capitalism. Which I stop to the next slide. Last, the last issue. He says, a new problem. He says, this difference in the mode of production between the private relations and the socialized forces can create the anarchy of production. Go back to what we're doing now. Remember, I told you the two things class exploitation and anarchy. So we now ex we already explained class exploitation, the surplus value, how it arises. Now he's explaining how the business cycle can occur. And his explanation is <laughs> the business cycle can occur. That's what he means by the anarchy of production. The business cycle, the downs and ups. The business cycle can occur because there is a his language, contradiction between private relations and socialized forces. And the effect of that contradiction is to stop the forces of production from progressing. To stop what we've done, the productivity of labor from going up. That's called a recession. So in times of recession, the forces of production no longer develop. United States today. The productivity of labor no longer rises. The average cost no longer falls. The supply curve of labor no longer shifts to the right. So what, what Engels is trying to explain then is that this calamity, this economic calamity and its social consequences are a result, A, this contradiction between relations and forces of production, and B, that's what capitalism produces. Okay, so I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you.